Hi everyone, my name is Hugh Brown and I'm here to give a talk about Polaris, machine learning for satellites. I'm one of the developers of the Polaris project. This is a recording of a talk that I was planning on giving at the CubeSat Developers Workshop in May of 2020. And I'm sad that that's not going to be happening. I was really looking forward to getting to meet everyone and learn more about the work that you do. I hope that this presentation will be interesting and I really look forward to the chance to meet you all again in uh, the 2021 workshop. And so with that, Let's get started. I'm going to be talking about Polaris, what it is, how we got started, what its, uh, what its purpose is, and what it can do. I'm going to be showing you what it can do, uh, giving a demonstration of the analysis that we've done for the LightSail 2 satellite. I'm going to be talking about the future of Polaris, the features we want to ask, or the features we want to add, but also asking you what you would like from Polaris, the folks who build and operate satellites. And finally, I'm going to be issuing an invitation to join us and help us make Polaris better. So, Polaris is available at our website, polarisml.space. It is an open source Python tool for exploring and analyzing telemetry data obtained from the SatNOGS network. Now, we are licensed under the LGPL v3. It's open source software. We're building on the amazing ecosystem that Python has for machine learning and data science. And we're analyzing telemetry that we obtained from the SatNOGS network. I need to take a moment here to shout, give a shout out to SatNOGS in particular. If you haven't come across SatNOGS before, it's a project maintained by the Libra Space Foundation. It is a network of over 200 ground stations all around the world running open source software and hardware collaboratively scheduled and capturing raw data and telemetry from satellites as they pass overhead. SatNOGS schedules these observations and makes the data it collects available to anyone to use. And without that data that they've collected and made available, we wouldn't be able to make Polaris. The goal of Polaris is to pave the way toward open source, autonomous satellite operations for missions at all scales anywhere in the solar system. Now, there's no question that is a big and hairy and audacious goal. And so our beginning is making available to satellite operators a machine learning generated analysis automatically derived of the telemetry captured for a particular satellite and offering them the insights that the machine learning model can present to them. The architecture of Polaris is pretty simple. At its heart, it's a Python command line application. There are three subcommands, three parts of Polaris, fetch, learn, and viz. Together, these represent the Polaris pipeline. So let's take a look at those components in a little more detail. You'll be noticing, by the way, that these diagrams are a little, a little spare. There, there's not much here. They do a lot right now, but there's no question we want to add more to Polaris. And that's going to be something I talk about uh, toward the end of my talk. So Polaris Fetch downloads data for a specified satellite for a specified time range from the SatNOGS network. Now I should make clear here, we're only able to download telemetry as opposed to raw radio data uh, when the satellite operators have elected to publish the specifications for that telemetry. I encourage everyone to do this. Uh, when you do so, you get a lot more interest in your project. You also uh, allow us to analyze that data and present the insights that Polaris can show. Without that, we can't do a whole lot. So the telemetry is downloaded, it's normalized, and passed on to Polaris Learn. Now, this is where we use machine learning techniques to automatically, without any human intervention, generate a dependency graph, a list of the telemetry elements captured for a particular satellite, and the model's estimate of the strength of variance between those two. So whether particular elements of the telemetry vary in concert with one another or not. We use XGBoost in order to generate that dependency graph, and we also support the use of grid search for hyperparameter tuning. The output of this is our dependency graph. This is uh, saved in the form of plain JSON, which uh, has a list of the nodes and strengths for the connections between those nodes. 
That can be consumed by Polaris Viz, but it can also serve as the input for other um, components that you may wish to, uh, to use. Polaris Viz is our visualization tool. It uses a built-in web server in the command line application. The user can run this on their laptop and in the browser it will present a three-dimensional interactive visualization of that dependency graph. It allows for searching, for highlighting, and is a good tool for exploring the model that Polaris Learn generates. And with that, it's a good time to talk about our demo here. I'm going to be presenting a analysis that Polaris generated, again, without any human intervention, for the LightSail 2 satellite. If you haven't come across the LightSail 2 project before, it's a wonderful project. It was uh, built by the Planetary Society, an organization that advocates for space exploration. And it was funded, I have to mention, by over 40,000 individual donors. And I'm proud to say that I was one of them. The Planetary Society's goal for this mission was to demonstrate that CubeSat form factor satellites in low Earth orbit can successfully use light uh, solar sailing in order to uh, alter and maintain their orbit. And it has been a great success. The satellite was launched in June of 2019. The, light, uh, the solar sail was deployed about a month later. And since then, they have hit all of their mission goals. They have successfully demonstrated altering their orbit through solar sailing. And it has been wonderful to be able to follow along with their mission and to use their telemetry data, which they published the specification for, in order to do this demonstration. So let's take a look at that. Now, I'm going to deepchaos.space, memorable URL, where you'll be able to see this um, demonstration here. If I hit reload here, we can see that the graph comes up and sort of unfolds before us. Kind of interesting. This is a model of the telemetry coming from the satellite. Our model um, generated this dependency graph. Each one of these spheres here represents a particular element of telemetry. So for example, here we've got torque Y power current. Uh, over here, this one that's a little more connected, we have five volt uh, PL power current. Over here, we have battery three voltage and so on. If I left click and drag around, I can shift this around, I can rotate it, I can get a sense for its overall shape. I can see some nodes here that are seemingly not connected with the main structure in the middle over here. Uh, that's where our model was un unable to find any historical connection uh, or dependency between how these varied and how the rest of these uh, varied. I can use the scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in and out on a particular uh, section of the graph. And I can use uh, right click here to drag it around, shift it up and down, and begin to look around at different things. If I click on one particular node, I should zoom in on it here. And here we go. And we can see that this node, 5 volt PL power current, has a lot of different connections here. This, uh, the, the connections are represented by these uh, structures coming out from here, the, the lines coming out. You can see the dots moving out at different speeds. The speed is meant to represent the strength of the connection between this node and another. So for example, if we zoom out a bit and kind of rotate around, we can see that this dot here heading out toward, uh, let's see, torque X power current, it's going pretty slowly. And so that particular connection is not very fast. Uh, by contrast, over here, we can see that this one going up to uh, NY interrupt power bus voltage is uh, a great deal a great deal faster and so that strength is a little more uh, or the, the strength of that connection is, is higher. Now I'm going to be showing you here how the satellite operator might use this graph in order to gain some insights. Now when I was looking around um, I was checking out different nodes. There was one in particular that was interesting to me, data free. Now I could search around for it on the graph, but I can also hit and hit uh, type its name up in the search bar here. So data free and hit enter. 
And now we'll zoom in on this particular one, okay? And we can zoom out and see some other connections that it has. And if I do this, what I can see here are some of the connections that it has to different nodes. So for example, this one up here is boot time. So it found that there was some, some way that it varied, uh, the, the data free varied in, um, in, in concert with the boot time telemetry item. It also varied in time with cam one picks remaining. Now, that one was interesting to me. Uh, so cam one picks remaining, camera one has a number of slots available for pictures. And this uh, telemetry item indicates how many of those slots remain unused. So that made sense to me. You could imagine uh, data free changing, probably going down as uh, more pictures are taken or um, becoming larger as, as uh, some of these slots are freed up. So that made sense to me. But also I noticed these connection to magnetometer readings, uh, mag PXX, mag PYZ. Um, there was another one over here. Yes, mag PXZ or PXZ. And I didn't know what to make of that. I wasn't sure why there would be a change in, in um, a, a common change between magnetometer readings and free disk space. And it occurred to me that there were probably a couple explanations I could come up with. So one guess might be that magnetometer readings need to be logged. In order to be logged, they need to be stored on disk and then passed down as, uh, as, as the satellite gets time to do so. So perhaps a changing magnetometer reading just means that there's more disk space taken down or, or taken up by those readings. However, um, the connection with CAM1 picks remaining was also sort of interesting. And so perhaps another explanation is that as pictures are taken, satellite probably needs to change its orientation. So it's pointed away from the blackness of space and at something more interesting like the Earth or something like this. And so the magnetometer readings would change as its orientation changed. And so that was, as I say, pretty interesting. So I decided to do a bit more explanation or exploration. So one thing that you can do in the search bar here is hit control enter when searching for a particular um, element of telemetry. So if I do that and hit control enter, what I can see is that this matching node has changed its color. Now that's dark red, it's a little hard to see, so I'm gonna change that a couple times so I get something a little better. There, light green, that's kind of nice. If I search for mag, I get all of the telemetry readings that have MAG in their name, all those magnetometer readings. And so if I hit control enter, I see them change color now. Similarly, we can look for cam uh, flags and highlight those in this blue color. If we zoom out a bit, we can see that we do get some interesting structures beginning to emerge from this overall main structure. Uh, there are some interesting collection of um, the camera statuses over here, for example. And down here is our magnetometer reading close to our original data free node. We can highlight different things as well. Perhaps we want to look at temperature. Now those are highlighted in purple. We can look for battery status and flag and highlight those in yellow. And with this, we now have a much better, richer view of the telemetry, seeing not just one central structure, but collections of substructures that make up the, the overall pattern here. And this would be the perfect time to go back to the satellite operator and say, what do these things indicate to you? What does this suggest to you? And with that, I'm gonna switch back to my uh, slides for the rest of the talk here. So I mentioned that we have plans for Polaris. We certainly do. So far, we have over 12 contributors from all over the world. We participated in the summer of Google Summer of Code last year, along with the European Space Agency's Summer of Code in Space. And we hope to participate again in those programs this year. We want to add more features to Polaris. So for Polaris Fetch, we'd like to be able to add more data to what we're already analyzing with Polaris Learn. We'd like, for example, to be able to fetch three line elements for satellites and use them to do orbital propagation. Be able to say things like, this is when 
the satellite was in eclipse or this is when it was over this or that particular magnetic anomaly. We would like to add support for other contextual information. So perhaps we could say things like this is when a particular space weather event uh, took place or this is when a command was issued to the satellite that changed its orientation. For Polaris Learn, we want to improve the analysis that we do on the telemetry we have. We want to add behavioral classification and prediction using uh, the algorithms we have and also other algorithms as well. We want to incorporate user feedback and use that to improve the model we get. And for Polaris Viz, we want to do more dependency graphs like the demo I showed you. Right now we update that graph for LightSail 2 every week or so as new data is captured by the SatNogs network. We'd like to do this for other satellites as well. Although again, we need the published specifications for telemetry in order to do that. We'd like to be able to highlight the outliers and warnings that Polaris learned to text and flag those for the operators. And we'd like to show our predictions, even support on-demand predictions. Finally, though, we want to ask you, the satellite builders and operators, what you would like from Polaris. We want to make this bigger. We have our horizon goal of autonomous operations in space, and we want to know what you need in order to make those things happen. So, in conclusion, even with some fairly simple analysis and initial exploration of the data for one satellite, we found some pretty interesting results. We need to collaborate with satellite operators and builders to validate those results and to get feedback about other features that would be useful. More data is going to yield even better results, whether that is more data from more satellites or being able to include data about hardware that's common between satellites so that even if the model for a particular star tracker, let's say, comes from another satellite, can still be incorporated into a model for another one. And with that, I'd like to invite you to contribute. You can reach us at polarisml.space. That has links to our chat room on riot.im. It has links to our code, links to our wiki, and our demo sites. And at polarisml.space, we would love to have you join. So with that, thank you very much for watching. And I really hope to be able to meet you at the 2021 CubeSat Developers Workshop. Thanks very much. Bye now.